Thank you again, Thank Lord, you. for Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm standing back there going, okay, oh, it's the Lord. And they're like, oh, it's you. Oh, really? Okay. I, I love that particular song. Uh, we sing that at my church all the time. And I just love that song because I can imagine us standing there. Can you? Can you try? Can you try? Us uh, standing there with Jesus on that first day when all of us are in the kingdom together and we are actually standing before his throne and we can see him with our eyes and we can see all that revelation talks about the worship that goes on in heaven but we were a part of it this time I, I tell everybody God is going to have to change me or else I'm just going to be passed out all the time I'm just I'm completely overwhelmed all the time I have to be changed in order to handle all of that incredibleness in one place. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? Amen. I am so looking forward to being able to look straight into the face of the one who gave his life for me. And be able to, in person, looking into his face, say, thank you. Thank you. You didn't owe me anything. But here I am. Here I am. I love Jesus today. Anybody else? Amen. Love Jesus. Amen. Let's give him a big round of applause. Can we give him a big round? And he has done some great things this weekend, hasn't he? I've been talking to some people and had the privilege to pray with some people. And oh, wow, God is up to good things. Power things. Saving lives, changing lives. Doing amazing, fabulous things. My heart is full. And it has been such a blessing to be with you this last few days. Um, truly, it has been such a blessing for me to be here with you this last few days. Thank you so much for coming out and um, wanting to grow and learn more about Jesus and passionately seeking after Him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And never lose your passion. I'll ask the Lord to fan the flames. Amen? Amen? And make us more passionate as time goes by to discover more of Him. Well, tonight, I just uh, I want to testify a little bit. Is that all right? No. Yes. Amen. Well, good, because I'm glad you agree, because I have the microphone I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> so one of you wrestles it out of my hand. No, um, I want to testify a little bit tonight, and I want to um, bring you a little bit of the Word of God. But at least in my life, it seems that, and tell me if this is the same in yours, um, life just seems to go from season to season. My life seems to have two seasons, a relative uh, space or season of peace, relative, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, a, a space of crisis will come, or the unexpected will show up in my life, and we're dealing with some drama, and we're dealing with some crisis, and some stress, and some different things. Is that kind of how it seems to work? Mm-hmm. It seems like we're going all right, relatively going okay, and then boom, the unexpected, and you know something, that is what you can count on in this life, <laughs> is that the unexpected right. is always around the corner. And that is why we desperately need Jesus. Because nothing is unexpected to him. Nothing takes him by surprise. He knows everything that's coming up. And guess what? He is not stressed about it. He's already got an answer. He's already got a solution. He's not worried. We need a friend like that. Amen? Amen. So I want to just share a little testimony with you. Back in 2008... My family was getting ready to go on a tour, and that's pretty much what we do. This is a little bit unusual for me to stay four days in one place, or have four services in one place. Um, usually I come in, do a concert, and, and then we leave and we go to another place. And we do tour after tour like this all year long. And we usually have a gigantic motorhome that we travel in. Uh, my family and I, my husband and I homeschool our boys. We have two. And because we were on the road so much, it's pretty much our only option. And so the motorhome suits our needs perfectly great. And so we travel all around. Usually eight to ten months out of the year, we are away from our hometown in Roseburg. Well, in October of 2008, we're getting ready to go on a six-week trip. Now, I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I've become really good at procrastinating. (laughs) Because the thing I hate about my job more than anything else is the packing and the unpacking and the constant laundry. Amen, ladies? So, I don't really love that. So I kind of push it off to the last minute. So just a couple of days before we take off for this long trip, I start to pack. Now that's a really
really dumb thing to do for me, and, and you think I'd learn over time, but I just don't seem to. And so I went to the last second. So I am up out of bed two days before we are leaving for this trip, and I've got a thousand things going through my head, and I've got armloads of stuff, and I'm running by the kitchen table, and the kids are, you know, sitting there, sleep still in their eyes, eating their breakfast, and my young son yells all after me as I run past the kitchen. I'm headed out the door, and he yells after me, Mom, Mom, I need you to help me with something. At this time, Alex was about five. And I turn around, arms full of stuff, and I say, what do you need? And he says, I need you to help me write a letter to Jesus. <laughs> okay. I, he never asked me to do that before, and I thought it was pretty neat, actually. But I couldn't do it right that second, because after all, I had my arms full of stuff, and I, I was on the way out the door, and I said, okay, I'll get back to you. Um, just as soon as I take this stuff out to the motor home and I put it down, I'll come in and help you write that letter. Okay. Well, lunchtime comes around, and I'm out the door again, and I pass the lunch table, and Alex yells after me, Mom, Mom, you should help me write that letter to Jesus. Oh, yes, yes, the letter to Jesus. We've got to do that. All right, so um, just a minute. <laughs> Let me put this down. And then I get to cleaning something or fixing something, and... You know where this story is headed, right? So 9 o'clock at night, oh. <laughs> I come in from my last trip to the motorhome, and I am exhausted. I have been cleaning and packing all day long. I stumble in the front door of our house, and this is the sight that greets me. My little boy, Alex, has given up on Mom. He is sitting using the couch cushions as a table. He has gone into our homeschool room and found the How to Write the Alphabet book. He's got himself a piece of paper and a pencil. And as I come in the door, I hear him trying to sound out the words to Dear God, the letters to Dear God. And instantly, I feel like the worst mother on the planet. <laughs> and I say to him, Oh, Alex, I'm sorry. This letter, yes, I'm so sorry. Let's go right now. Right now, we'll go to the dining room table and you tell me what you want to say and I will say it for you. Do we have that, Mike? So this is actually the letter. Actually, before you show, oh, it's very hard to read. Um, before you show that, we sit down and just as we sit down, my husband, Mike, walks to the front door and he sees what's going on and he says, finally, <laughs> someone is helping Alex with his letter. I didn't know it, but when Alex wasn't after me to help him, he was after Dad to help him. <laughs> this kid wanted to write a letter to Jesus. And it was going to get done sometime today whether we helped him or not. And let me tell you what's unusual about that. Alex is, I call him my firecracker kid. He explodes on the scene with great noise and color. And he is everywhere at one time. My son is a flurry of motion and movement. He has always been. And especially when he was five years old. He had an attention span about that long, seriously. So for him to ask me all day, I want to write a letter to Jesus, to stay on track with that one thought was extremely unusual for him. <laughs> so we sit down, all the three of us now at the table, and Alex begins to dictate a letter. I'm going to see if I can read it here in this, this lightness. It says, Dear God, he says, I really want to see you. I'm sending a letter to you because I really love you, my Lord. And on Christmas, it's going to be your birthday. I really, really want to see what you look like. Love. Oh. Alex. Just a simple little prayer, a little letter to God that says, I love you, I'm anxious to get to know you better, I want to see you. And this was the end of October, so he's thinking about Christmas, and, and, and we celebrate Jesus' birthday then, and he just had to write that. And as soon as he signed his name at that bottom, immediately he says to me, All right now, Mom, we have to fire it. <laughs> what firing it means at my house <laughs> is every Christmas we wrap up a little box and we cut a slit in the top. And then we pass out pencils and papers and we ask people to write down a gift that they would like to give Jesus for their birthday. After all, we're celebrating his birthday. He should get a gift. Amen. Amen. So maybe it's something like, I'm going to give you more time this year, Lord. Or 
this particular cherished sin, I will release it to you, or whatever it is. And then we put these little slips of paper inside this box, and we take it over to our fireplace, and we set it on fire, and while it burns, we sing happy birthday to Jesus. Now, the reason that we burn it is because the Bible talks about the incense, the smoke of the incense rising, representing the prayers of the saints. So it's just our symbolic way of sending our gifts to Jesus. And Alex remembered that. So it made sense. We've written the letter. Now we got to send it. So he made all four of us go on that porch. And we took a little ceramic bowl and we put the letter inside the bowl. And we set it on fire. And as it burned, each one of us took turns picking a worship course. And I have to tell you, of all the crazy busy things I did that day, the most precious was that moment out there with my family, having this precious worship over this little letter that Alex had written. And you know what? I nearly missed it altogether because I was so concentrating on getting the to-do list done. Right? We do that a lot, don't we? We just, we just see this big to-do list in our mind. It's got to get done. We'll sacrifice all kinds of things just to get the list, something marked off. But often God is calling us to put the list aside and say, pay attention, I've got some better things I'd like to show you. And so as we all left the back porch and I stepped over the threshold from my sliding glass door into the kitchen, I heard the Holy Spirit say to my heart, remember this. And I remember standing there halfway in the kitchen going, okay, Lord. And so I just kind of tucked it away. And and two days later in the morning, our family jumped up into our motorhome. It was November 1st. And we began to drive. We drove north, actually up I-5, and we took Highway 84 east and got on that highway that separates Oregon from Washington because our first concert was actually in eastern Washington or Eastern Oregon, I should say. And so we were only about a half an hour in. It was one of those great days from Roseburg to where we were. It had been a great day. The kids weren't fighting, and that is a miracle right there. (laughs) It was just peaceful in the motor home. And Mike and I were actually able to sit down. This was rare, especially when you have really small children. We put on a CD, uh, some kind of worship music, and we were listening to it. And it had just finished, and I was getting ready to put on another one. Glorious! We listened to a whole CD. And nobody interrupted us. The kids were doing their own thing. So we put in, I I stood up to go put another one in. And I turned around and almost made it to my captain's chair when we heard this incredibly loud bang. Wow, that was loud. Were you guys going to get your eardrums still in place? Didn't quite make it that loud. Okay, sorry. It sounded literally like all of the tires on the motorhome had exploded all at once. I mean, that's really what it sounded like. And we had enough time. Mike and I both looked at each other. I'm still standing. I just have a hold of the top of my captain's chair. Mike and I look at each other real quick, and both of us, what was that? And that's all we had time to do. And all of a sudden, our 36-and-a-half-foot motorhome pulling a 12-foot trainer was completely out of control all over Highway 84. What actually happened is a semi-truck pulling triple trailers was trying to pass us. And witnesses had told us later that this semi-truck, for some time, had been a a real danger on the highway. It had nearly taken out a few cars further back. And what happened is we were coming up this hill and making a little turn. He sped up to try to pass us on this hill. And as he did, his third trailer literally fell over on top of the back half of our motorhome. And when it did that, it separated the ceiling from the wall in the back half of the motorhome and took out a huge chunk of our back bedroom and opened up our motorhome to the freeway. Um, So inside the motorhome, we don't really know that that's what happened. We just know we're out of control. And there's a semi-truck next to us trying to pass us, and we head 65 miles an hour for the cement guardrail, and there's nothing we can do about it. We're just headed there. And we strike it and slide all the way down it and ping-pong off of it and shoot across the highway straight into that semi-truck who's now doing all this kind of stuff. And we do a crazy little dance together, that semi-truck and, and us. We slid all the way down that truck and ping-pong back the other way and struck that guardrail again. And we just kept doing this. And every time we would go back and forth, the motorhome would lay further over on each side. And in my mind, 
it is amazing what you can think in just a few seconds. <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm praying, dear Jesus, please do not let this motor home fall over. Because that's what it felt like we were going to do if this kept up. And ladies, I was doing that. Uh, a lot of stuff going on in my mind, but honestly, there was only one word coming out of my mouth really loud and really long. And I was doing one of those things that we do, when, when, especially as women, get a little bit uh, freaked out. Yes! The scream! I'm so glad that the Lord understands scream prayers. <laughs> one word, Jesus, really long and really loud. <laughs> Felt like I was holding that one word forever and ever. Just, it's all I could think to get out. And there was so much going on. And the whole time I'm holding on to the top of this captain's <laughs> chair. And we're just going back and forth. Finally, after about the third time we struck that guardrail, we were getting ready to shoot off across the highway again, and it, would, it felt as though some mighty big angels just decided that that was enough because we literally just stopped on the side of the road, came to a screeching halt, and we're sitting there on the side of the road. And the instant thing I think of is my kids. Where are my kids? So I turn around. And the motorhome looks like a war zone now. Every cupboard, every the refrigerator, pots and pans, TVs, VCRs, everything has flown through the air and emptied out all over everything. And thankfully, Josiah had been sitting on the breakfast bar. He was now on the floor. And we have this crazy little extra, we had this crazy little um, extra counter. And somehow that thing flew up, and he went underneath it. And it kept him from getting hit by all the crazy stuff flying through the air. So he's sheltered underneath this little counter thing. But I can't see Alex. And I suddenly remember that the last time I saw him, he was laying on the bed oh, man. in the back of the motorhome watching a veggie tail on TV. Oh. Now I turn my gaze all the way to the back of the motorhome from the front. I haven't moved from the front yet. And there's a huge hole in the wall. I can see the freeway. And the place where Alex was sitting... Well, now there's a TV there and closet doors and all kinds of debris laying right where he had been laying, about a foot from that opening in the wall. And I start screaming out his name, and there is no answer. And so you know the thought that's going through my mind. Dear Jesus, he did not go out through the hole in the wall. We were doing this, remember, pretty violently. And all I can think of is there's open up to the... I see cars from the front of the motorhome. Where is Alex? So I start trying to get through the debris down the hallway. I'm calling them, I'm calling them. There's no answer. And right as I get to where our bedroom begins in the back of the motorhome, suddenly this little blonde head peeks around the corner and says, Mom, what was that? (laughs) I grabbed that little head and nearly suffocated it right here. (laughs) I squeezed him so hard, instant tears just shot out of my face. And instantly, everything that is really important in life became very clear. I am standing in the rubble of our life. We were driving down the highway, listening to music. Nothing was wrong in a second. Everything changed. And now everywhere I look, there is rubble. Our motorhome was utterly destroyed. And yet, I got my little boy right here. And Josiah's okay. Mike is okay. I said to him, honey, I don't know what that was. But I know this. We're okay. You and me and Daddy and Josiah and Alex, and that's all that matters. We're okay. And I sat there absolutely flooded with gratefulness because we stood there. Because for whatever reason, I'm no more holy than anybody else, and I know a lot of good Christian people who have suffered through terrible accidents and lost family members. And for whatever reason, the Lord decided to spare us all that day. I guess he wasn't finished with us yet. But we suddenly smelled a gas leak. Um, And so we quick grabbed the kids, and, and we threw open... The, the door so that we could just start and we started throwing the kids out <laughs> and it was raining and they didn't have any shoes on and no coats and just as I threw open the door there was a trucker who had seen the whole thing happen he pulled off the side of the road and this poor, poor, poor gentleman had the misfortune of meeting me face to face after this crazy <laughs> accident <laughs> still in shock me I open the door and he says are you okay? and 
out of my mouth came nothing that I'm sure made any sense except it sounded like, Jesus loves us, Jesus saves us, and I just love Jesus, and Jesus is over here, and I'm so thankful that Jesus and my kids are okay, and Jesus, I love God, and I'm praying 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 Jesus. And he goes, okay then. <laughs> And he helps us get the kids out and the dog out. The dog just flew out. We had a little dog. Uh, we also had several hamsters with us on that trip. I have boys, remember. And those hamsters, we thought they were all dead. Their cages went from one side of the motorhome and smashed against the wall on the other side of the motorhome. And there was just little brightly covered confetti, plastic pieces of confetti everywhere. And we thought, oh, they're, they're gone. And, and, and would you believe... Those suckers survived. <laughs> and, and I was actually really distressed about it. We, we thought they were all dead. And so we, we, we throw the kids outside. And we walk, I'm going back in to try to find some shoes. And I see this one is crawling around. <laughs> and I grab it. And at first I'm thinking, yay. And then I think, but I don't. I have a hamster. <laughs> and no cage. And I don't know. And I'm in shock. So I'm standing outside. This, I love this man, this, this little uh, this trucker that was standing out there. I'm wandering around outside going, I have a hamster. I have a hamster. I have a hamster. You know, I'm just kind of repeating it over and over, wandering around. And finally, this gentleman realizes I desperately need help. And he walks over and he takes it from me and he says, Give me the hamster. I felt like he would be willing to say, Step away from the hamster. You're scaring us all. <laughs> you know, so he takes the hamster and he doesn't know what to do with either, but he puts it in his pocket. <laughs> And then he's also got my dog on a leash. We found the leash. So this, this gentleman is so fabulous. My dog on a leash, a hamster in his pocket. And we're standing out on the side of the road. And my oldest son, Josiah, starts to walk like he's going into the woods. And I said, Josiah, I, I'm concerned. I'm thinking maybe he's in shock. And he's just kind of wandering off. I said, you know, come back. And he turns around. And he gives me a look that I normally would not tolerate. But he looks at me and he goes... <laughs> I have no idea what's going on but he's serious about it whatever it is standing here with this trucker now I have said about a thousand things about Jesus really fast in a short period of time and he never once has said anything that has made me believe that he's a believer as well in fact he looks frightened by me and never said you know well God is good or man that's great or anything just he's just helping us with the animals and so he's standing here next to me and Josiah wanders away and we're all kind of watching him puzzled at what does he think he's doing and he wanders out it's pouring down it's starting to rain heavier and he walks away and he kneels down on the ground in the mud and in the rain and he clasps his hands together and he leans his forward his forehead so far over that he almost is touching the ground and he starts crying out in a loud voice Jesus please help us Jesus please help us and I'm already so emotional at this sight just kind of I have to look away so I look away because I'm losing it and my gaze happens to hit the gentleman who's standing there with the hamster and a dog. <laughs> and he's got this crazy look on his face. Confusion and awe. And he's staring at my son like, what in the world is this? And my little boy is crying out to the one he knows who can help. Please help us. I'm standing there with this scene going on and Alex is standing next to me and it suddenly occurs to me to ask him what what happened when you heard the big bang where, where did you go and he looks up at me and I'll never forget the look on his face it was a look as if I needed to know the answer to that I should know the answer to that and he looks up at me and he says well I heard a voice say get on the floor so I did <laughs> Miracle number one, he obeyed the first time. <laughs> Miracle number two, he heard a voice say, Get on the floor. 
Do you know what instantly came flooding back into my mind? The letter. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I remember the whole day long, Mom, I need to write, write, write a letter to Jesus. Mom, I need to write a letter to Jesus. Mom, you need to help me write a letter. Do you know what was really going on? Jesus knew that in a couple of days, my little boy was going to need to become very familiar with his voice. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And so all day, two days before, he began to prepare my son, Alex. Alex, listen to me, son. I need you to write me a letter. Listen to me. I need you to hear me. I need you to obey what I say. We're going to practice all day long today. Because in a couple of days, we're just going to have a few seconds to hear and obey. And so I'm just going to talk to you all day long. Alex, do you hear me? Do you hear me, son? Write me a letter. And so when the time came, for Alex to hear and obey. He was ready. The unexpected is always around the corner. That's why we need Jesus. Because <laughs> nothing is unexpected to him. And if we stay connected to him, please listen here. You get ready to leave and go home to your separate places where you live and your different churches. What a blessing it's been to all be together. When you leave, stay connected to Jesus. Don't forget the things you've learned. Don't, don't, don't let the cares of this life and the demands of this life and the stuff of this life cause you to forget that we need to hang out with Jesus every day and stay plugged in, abiding with Him every day because He knows what's coming up tomorrow. And He can prepare us for whatever's coming as long as we can hear. Right? I mean, what if tomorrow you're standing in a grocery store and you come face to face with somebody who asks you some really hard questions, questions that you don't know the answers to. And maybe the answers to these questions are extremely important to this individual. Maybe it will even save their life, their physical life, their spiritual life. And you don't know what the right answer is, but if you're connected to the King, to the Savior, and you just say, Lord, help me, a little prayer, and you're used to being hearing his voice, used to being plugged in, immediately he can give you all the wisdom you need for that moment. Because nothing takes him by surprise. What if you're like my son, and something's going to come up, and God needs to get your attention now. we got to be plugged in, we got to be connected, because the unexpected is always around the corner. That's the one guarantee we have about this life. Unexpected things happen. We can't control it. But I know the one who controls the future. And I know the one who can prepare me for whatever tomorrow holds. So, that gentleman standing there looking at my son, the guy who has my hamster and my dog. (laughs) It's raining pretty heavy now. And he comes up and he asks me, he says, can we... Can I take your kids to the ambulance that just showed up? And he said, I'd love to put them in the ambulance and get them out of the rain. And I was trying to help Mike gather up some things, and I said, yeah, you know what, that would actually be a huge help. Thank you. And so I watch him take two little boys and a dog and a hamster (laughs) and start walking towards the ambulance. And as they get just about to the ambulance, he does something really strange and beautiful. He gets down on his knees in the mud and in the rain and two little boys get down with him and they pray and later I asked Josiah I said what did the gentleman pray he said he was just really emotional and he just wanted to say thank you to God for protecting our family and ask God if he would continue you know I don't know if that man knew Jesus before this moment or if he met him on the side of highway 84 but listen to what I'm going to tell you right here A lot of tragedy can happen in this life in a second. A lot of difficult things can suddenly come up and hit us. Do you know why I love Jesus? Because no matter how ugly it is, no matter how horrifying it can be, if I am a friend of God and I'm holding His hand, I can look back on events even like that horrible event where everything we owned was wiped out from under us. And do you know what I remember? A little boy who says he heard a voice. Another little boy wandering off and praying out and crying out for his God to help him. A gentleman who I don't think knew Jesus who discovered him in the middle of all that ugliness. Yeah, there's a lot of ugly and horror. But if 
that Jesus walks through the wreckage of our life with us. He can leave us with beautiful snapshots, beautiful pictures, of beautiful things. So that when we look back, we don't just see the horror, we don't just see the pain, we see His glory and His power and His love. Praise the Lord. I think that's awesome. Uh-huh. So I told you about Alex's love letter he wrote to Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you about some hate mail. A couple of weeks later, we get a letter in the mail from our insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, Do you have a vacant, sir? Even though it wasn't your fault and you weren't excited and the other driver was, we're going to give you $18,000 less than what you owe on your motorhome. Have a nice day. Wow, that was a real blow. We needed that motorhome. We homeschool our kids. We drive all over the country. It's what we do for a living. This is how things are done. Lord, what are we going to do? We not only don't have a motorhome, but we owe so much money on it that we actually can't purchase another one right now. So now what? And the voice of the enemy kept creeping in trying to say, well, I guess you're just done for. (laughs) I guess you're just done. And, And all these discouraging voices started to talk. And we thought, well, we're not going to give up that easy. we got a minivan. So we piled the kids and the dog. We did not take the hamster. And and we got into this minivan. And my husband deserves an award for a, for a fabulous master packmanship. Is that a word? <laughs> because by the time he was done packing our minivan, you could not see daylight between any crack of any kind of luggage or musical equipment or even us. Yeah. I and mean, we were just sardined in there. And we did that for two months because we were trying to finish out our dates after our motorhome accident. And we did that until the children started walking, just walking by the van and start going home <laughs> with the window. <laughs> I don't want to do it. So we said, okay, Lord, we can't keep doing this like this. It's not working out. We can't homeschool. We have to get out of hotels at 11. You know, we're not done with homeschool yet. It's just not working. It won't work. And so we stopped everything. We took our hands off everything. We just stopped booking. We stopped doing concerts. And for a couple of months, we just prayed. And do you know why? Because there was a story in the Bible that we remembered about a king who got a bad newsletter. Just like we had. Did you ever get a bad newsletter? Maybe it says something like, uh, you have cancer. Or, I want a divorce. Or, you have no more money. (laughs) There's all kinds of bad newsletters, isn't there? Sometimes they actually come to your mailbox, but a lot of times they come to the mailbox of your heart. And your enemy sends them. I want to talk to you just for a minute tonight about Hezekiah before I leave you because I love this story. It's a huge inspiration to me. King Hezekiah, one of my very favorite stories in the Bible, one of my very favorite kings. One of the reasons is because his dad was Ahaz and a really lousy king, and he didn't really love God. And so I love the fact that you can come from lousiness, (laughs) and God can make your life glorious. He can use you in incredible ways if you're willing to trust him and obey him, and follow him. And so here Hezekiah is, and I want to read to you what the Bible says about him. 2 Kings 18, 3-7 said, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, and there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commandments that the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. And then I love this. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. While Hezekiah was king, the Assyrian kings had pretty much taken over the world. The Israelite nations, uh, Judah and and the northern kingdoms of Israel, they, they were declining steadily because they just had not been faithful to the Lord. And the Lord kept warning them, if, if, you don't, if you don't stay faithful to me, I can't protect you. Enemies are going to come in. They're going to rise up. But they wouldn't listen. And so, actually, while Hezekiah was king, uh, the Assyrian kings came and invaded the northern kingdoms of Israel. And they went into captivity and also Assyria or Samaria. And so, 
This was a formidable foe, and still I love the guts of Hezekiah. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and refused to serve him. Okay, here's this gigantic power. There's King Sennacherib and a massive army. And they're paying, Judah is paying tribute to this king. Basically, stay away from me money, you know, just appeasing me money. Because he's bigger than them and they're paying him taxes. Well, Hezekiah decides one day that he believes something. And I'm really hoping that you believe this tonight too. God's people should not be slaves to anyone. Maybe slaves to righteousness, but never slaves to any enemy. Amen? Amen. God's people should never be slaves. And so he just decides, I'm not paying you any more taxes. I'm not paying you any more tribute. Well, what do you think that did with Sennacherib? You think I sat too well? No, it did not. <laughs> and so, even though everything that, Sinek, uh, that Hezekiah had done up to this point had been blessed of God, and, and he had been able to enjoy a relative space of peace, now he's a little bit in trouble because Sennacherib isn't very happy with him. And it says in Second Chronicles 32, 1, After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. And in 2 Kings 18.13, it says, In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. All the fortified cities of Judah. And in Sennacherib's own diaries, he claims to have taken 46 of the walled cities of Judah. All that's left is Jerusalem. So Hezekiah quickly grabs some kind of silver and some gold and some sort of bribe stuff and gives it to to Sennacherib, and Sennacherib turns back for a while. He buys for himself a little space of peace again. What I love is that while Hezekiah was enjoying this relative space of peace where the enemy had backed off from Jerusalem, he doesn't do what I'm tempted to always do in a space of peace. Tell me if you feel the same way. When things are going well, I really just feel like I can just sit right here and put my feet up and enjoy it. Amen? I want to stick my spiritual feet up and I want to go, oh, things are good, nothing bad is happening, hallelujah. I'm just going to sip some iced tea and just enjoy this, right? But there's nothing like a good trial to draw me to my knees. And unfortunately, I don't hit my knees as much and as fervently unless I'm in trouble and I hate that about me. But Hezekiah has a different idea. He has an understanding and I hope you have this understanding too tonight. Hezekiah knew he had an enemy. You have an enemy tonight. You have an enemy. He's alive and well. He's defeated at the cross. Amen? But as long as he still breathes, and as long as we're still here in a sinful world, he is out to attack God's people and destroy those who have the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. Amen? He's angry at us. We have a big target, a big bullseye painted on us. He hates us. We have an enemy. And Hezekiah knew he had an enemy, a serious enemy, who could take the walled cities, everything but Jerusalem. And so instead of just putting his spiritual feet up and just going, I'm going to just going to enjoy this peace, he gets busy. And I wish I had time tonight to share with you what he does, but I call them the four W's. He messes with the water in preparation for attack he knows is coming. He messes with the wall. He fixes all the broken pieces of the wall because he knows the enemy will attack him at his weakest point. And so he fixes the wall. He makes sure there's no water out there to sustain his enemy when the enemy comes because he knows the enemy's coming. And he knows that they'll sit up in that fertile valley where there's water flowing through and they can just hang out there for as long as they want, as long as they've got water. So he cuts off the water and he redirects it into the city so God's people under besiegement will have lots of water. And then he goes from there and he increases massive amounts of weapons, all the darts and the shields. And it cracks me up because he doesn't have enough people to carry these things. So Nebuchadnezzar has this massive army and even though he's increasing all his weaponry in the natural, Hezekiah doesn't have the soldiers to carry them. It doesn't matter. Hezekiah is not going to sit around and do nothing. He knows he has an enemy. He knows the enemy is planning an attack. He knows one day it's coming. And he is not going to be caught unprepared. Now, I think that all of those physical things that he does actually have spiritual um, significance behind them. But tonight I don't have time to share that with you. 
But I am going to talk about the last W because it comes right before the actual attack hits. So Hezekiah does everything he can to get ready. And then the attacks start coming. There's three of them, actually. And what really is amusing is that all three of them never get beyond the verbal stage. Now that sounds like our roaring lion enemy, doesn't it? Often he runs around and likes to talk a lot. He uses a lot of words and a lot of intimidation with those words because often he doesn't need to do anything but that. See, Sennacherib's officials come with a great big army and they come to outside of Jerusalem and they demand that Hezekiah come out, but Hezekiah just sends out his officials. And they attack the officials, and I'm not going to read you exactly what they say, I'm going to paraphrase, because basically it's this. Hey, we're big and you're little. We're strong and you're weak. Your allies are weak, your God is weak. And besides, your God is sending us to get you, so you know what, just surrender. <laughs> They're standing there looking at Hezekiah's officials, and Hezekiah's officials simply say... You know what, could you just speak to us in your language? Because we know your language and we don't want the people on the wall to hear you talking. That's all they say. And so that group's officials are irritated because they've come for a fight. And so they turn to the people on the wall and in Hebrew they scream out basically the same thing. We're big and you're little. We're strong and you're weak. Your God cannot possibly help you. Look at all the other nations he's not been able to help. Give up. Oh, and by the way, when you surrender, you know, it won't be so bad because we'll take you to a land that's kind of similar to your own and you probably won't even hardly notice that you're in captivity. Satan is constantly trying to talk us into captivity and trying to make it look good. He wants to be your master. He wants you to be his slave. And he's a liar. Captivity never is good. It never is. And so... The people on the wall are utterly silent. Why? Because Hezekiah told them, whatever they say to you, say not a word. So here, I want you to, this is an amusing scene. Huge army from Sennacherib, officials. A few officials of Hezekiah standing outside the wall, everybody inside the city, and you can hear crickets. 